Hey everyone, thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 349. Today, I'm gonna sit down with a couple friends and talk about Iron Fist Season 2 from Netflix, but not just digging into the show. We're actually not going to give you any spoilers. And in fact, it turns into a great conversation about martial arts, cinema, and television. So stick around if you're interested in any of those things. If you're new to the show, you may not know my voice. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for this show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I love the martial arts. So I turned it into a business, and you can check out everything we make at whistlekick.com. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you'll save 15%. You can check out the show notes for this episode, for all the other episodes, all for free, at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. But now, I'm just going to step back, and I'm going to let my friend Sensei Scott Bolin introduce our conversation. So, take it from here, Scott. Hey, everybody. This is Scott Bolin, and I'm here with Jeremy Lesniak and Jared Wilson, and we're going to be talking about some Iron Fist Season 2 and kind of how it relates to uh, the martial arts world and and, uh, martial arts and cinema and things of that nature. But, I mean... It got canceled, so hopefully, hopefully we can draw some non-correlation. <laughs> I set All them up martial arts are them down. <laughs> done. <laughs> That's the show, folks. We're done. All right. Anyway. <laughs> Fastest show ever. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Go buy some things. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. Great timing. Great timing, to everybody. Um, so, it, it, you yeah, know, I, I'm going to take a, a, the smallest of tangents and let everyone know that the three of us talk fairly regularly because of Marshall Journal, not so much in voice, but in typing. And of course, there are others. And this is what our chat is like constantly. <laughs> it, it, I, it can, is, I can verify that. Yes, it, it's it is very the much adult like adult digital equivalent of a of a fraternity. <laughs> I think that's, anyway, actually, that's, actually no. very, that's actually very, very apt. Oh yeah, so it got it got canned. Um, I think we should start there. Let's yeah, talk about that. Obviously, I think we it's should. The biggest takeaway for for the entire thing, for the entire the for for season two, the ending is that it ended, and it it well, it ended with so much to, promise and so much uh, yeah. openness of plot. Well, yeah, it was showing you so many different tangents that it was prepared to go into that were, oh, quite frankly, interesting. If you're, if, if you if you spent the time to watch all ten episodes, you were already invested. And if you know anything about any of those characters, which I was never a big Iron Fist comic book reader, but I understood the character. I knew some generalities about it, and uh, you know some of the other characters that were related. Uh, yeah, I was kind of excited to see where they took it, and well, well, <laughs> I guess not. It could be that Disney took it back, is where it could be. Well, it, it's funny you say that because to this day, um, what is this like? A couple weeks since they announced it, or a week and a half or two, and not a single person. Uh, you know, there's lots of places that dedicate themselves, whether it's on YouTube or in written form to talking about the ins and the outs and the innuendo and the, the rumors and all this stuff of what's, who's going where and what's doing what. No one seems to know what the end game, if there is an end game, is. No one knows whether Netflix is going to repackage the shows into uh, take these characters and then kind of just uh, put them together in uh, this is not a spoiler to say, you know, they've been talking about Heroes for Hire for a long time where Luke Cage and Iron Fist are together. And then there's been talk of Daughters of the Dragon with Misty Knight and uh, Colleen Wing. Right. So are they going to do that? Or did Disney say, um, you know, they're ours, we're done. But, you know, how does this work? And nobody knows anything about that. It's almost dead silent, which right. I'm surprised at. And, and I think it's important for, you know, just in case somebody's listening and they don't know that Disney owns the rights to Marvel, to everything of Marvel, mm-hmm. to the whole lot of it. And of course, there are contracts that have been signed going out for who knows how many years on movies and other things. So there are things that Disney can't do, but Disney is also 
in the midst of launching their own online streaming platform. If you take a look at Netflix, yeah. the one catalog of content that is noticeably absent has pretty much always been absent is everything that Disney owns. And so Disney is getting going. And when we as adult men, because we are adult men, think about Disney, what do we think of first and foremost? We think of kids' movies. Yeah. We think of child entertainment. But if all of a sudden it was children's entertainment and all of the Marvel stuff, well, now that's far more compelling as a family platform. And that very well may be entering in. Well, I mean, between them buying up Lucasfilm, uh, Marvel, now Fox, they bought up everything of Fox that doesn't involve sports or, or news. Right. They have made a – They, for me personally – They the own Disney, my childhood at this point. Yeah, well, di- the Disney name – is just one facet of the entire, you know, m- m- mega monolith. You know, it's 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 gigantic now. It's a very powerful um, mouse. <laughs> yes, that mouse ma- that mouse has been to the gym and has been pumping some iron. Mm-hmm. Um, but so you know, the future is extraordinarily up in the air as far as where these characters may go. But um, I think talk about broader things for sure. Well, I think it's, you know, just to go back to the beginning with it, the fact that they gave a martial arts superhero his own platform, to use the term, is pretty incredible. Netflix has been doing pretty good with the martial arts in general. They had, um, they were the main financiers behind the Crouching Tiger 2, the, the Green Destiny movie. So they've been putting out a bunch of good stuff. They just recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago at this point, uh, said they're going to do the live action Avatar, which, you know, talking about kids stuff, that thrills me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then they've got, uh, they just released uh, The Night Comes for Us with uh, with basically anybody and everybody you've seen in the two Raid movies. And uh, if Eco Weiss has been in it, a bunch of his friends are in it too. Uh, which, and it's extraordinarily heavy martial arts it's it's a little on the gory side, and I'll plug Marshall Journal. Tristan Glover, uh, uh, he he uh, put out a YouTube video, and he's actually going to be releasing an article here real soon for it. Awesome. awesome. So now, when we think about Iron Fist, when we look back, let's you know we talked about the death, and I'm sure that we'll we'll circle back to that because it's hard not to. But if we talk about season two versus season one, I think when when the three of us have been kind of chatting and and talking about what we wanted to talk about this evening. That was a big piece that kept coming up was the contrast between season one and two. So what do you guys see as the major differences between the two seasons? Well, this way uh, I can stop. Uh, I'm going to put it this way. Uh, Iron Fist got his black belt in season one. He kind of knew that he knew some stuff, but uh, (laughs) I, I call it the warp syndrome. You know, it, it's like Worf on Star Trek was this big, huge Klingon guy. But as soon as, and he could beat the crap out of anyone until another Klingon showed up. That was kind of Iron Fist. He was this huge, powerful martial artist until another martial artist came. And then he got beat up. So in season two, he kind of, they kind of got past that and said, well, now he has the skills and now he's kind of maturing and trying to figure out what it means to have those skills. Yeah, I actually, uh, my, my thoughts kind of somewhat parallel there. I always kind of, I kind of felt like, and I've, I've said this in another venue before, but uh, when someone asked me about it, I said in season one, he was, he kind of reminded me like a, a, a yellow slash orange belt, you know, one or two belts in, knows a few things, the whole, a whole new world is opening up to him, but he thinks he knows a lot and then finds out typically often that he doesn't really know that much. Um, and then I kind of felt like, you know, between uh, the defenders and uh, his appearance in Luke Cage, uh, maybe less so the Luke Cage, but in defenders, I kind of felt like he was, you know, mid, mid high rank. He's, he's definitely kind of calmed down with the, you know, I am the immortal iron fist and, I'm, you know, telling everybody what he is, although he still told people a lot. Um, and then in this one, yeah, I felt like I felt like there was kind of almost a black belt level there. Like when you find out, you get a black belt thinking that that's the pinnacle, and then you realize actually that's just a stop on the way. 
um, you know, and you feel, you realize how little you actually truly uh, do know. Now, when we talk about that, I think we're really talking about the writing and the way that the yeah. writing went. Now, when we did our conversation around season one, right, we did, we did do that. I'm not imagining that. Um, I don't think we actually Didn't I talk to somebody. Jared, did you, I talk to you? you? No, it wasn't me. Oh. You took okay. a, I, you had a, you had a, you had one of the, you had a short episode about it, just talking about, um, did I talk what to it myself? Was. I don't, I thought, I thought there was an article that we did on Marshall. All right. We'll figure oh. out. I talked to somebody somewhere about something related. To <laughs> I think it was actually one of your regular, uh, interview episodes where you guys ended up talking about that for a, a, sm- a decent chunk of their All time. Right, well, maybe we, maybe you got we'll into it. Link to that then. Cause apparently I don't know <laughs> who that was or what happened. <laughs> But anyway, when I think about season one, then my number one takeaway is that it seemed rushed. And we did have documented proof that what's his face? What's his name? Finn Jones. Finn Jones, Finn Jones. had yeah. like seven minutes of training before he got on camera and actually did work. That, that's actually pretty close to the truth right there. Right? <laughs> it, was, and, it was pretty close. He, and when we he take, said constantly he was learning stuff right before shooting. Right. And when we take that into account, I thought season one was quite good. But it would not surprise me that if his training was rushed, everything was rushed. The writing was rushed. All of it was rushed. And with season two, it didn't feel rushed. It felt nuanced. It felt like there mm-hmm. was depth to the acting, to the character development, to the storyline, and even to the fight scenes. To me, the fight scenes had this nuance, this... Emotional thing. content? Yeah, there was. There were, it wasn't just punch, punch, kick, kick, fall, block, get up, bleed, right? Like there was, there was more. Mm-hmm. They were thought out. It was, how do we make this different and better? And you could tell that people sat around a table and chatted about it. I, I totally agree. Uh, I didn't hate season one um, as much as some did. It was slow. The pacing was very off. Um, there was a lot of time spent talking about things that you know they could have just elaborated on briefly somewhere else it didn't we didn't need to spend that much visual time on certain things but again rushed rushed felt it felt rushed um despite 13 hours of runtime it felt rushed um well i think in season one you had to do the origin story too so that sure that ate up a lot of time iron fist isn't the hugest name in the marvel universe and i think in season two they're like Okay, good. We're done with that. Everybody knows who everybody is. Okay, let's fight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, well, there was that too. Good point. But um, I, I feel like I feel like to to what Jeremy said, every the the fight scenes. There was a point. There were stakes in the fight scenes. They weren't just there as some kind of a hey, we gotta. This is getting boring. We gotta make sure we throw a little throw a little flash on here. <laughs> You know, if everything, not perfectly, of course, I mean, I'm sure I could get into a gripe, but it had emotional content. It had, it had stakes, which the first season didn't feel like the stakes were really there when they should have been. Should we think about season one as almost a prequel? I could, I could get down with that. If you called it that, I would probably, I'd probably would critique it a little less harshly. Yeah. Because what I hadn't considered until Jared said it was the idea that very few people know who Iron, who knew who Iron Fist was prior. I, I didn't. Right. So I, I, I enjoy, you know, I read some comic books as a kid and I was aware of some of these characters by name, but I definitely didn't have the body of knowledge that some of my friends do when they, you know, jump into an Avengers movie or whatever. So I wonder if that was part of the dilemma that they really wanted to get to the defenders. And they said, oh, crap, we have to give a backstory to Iron Fist, who nobody knows. Uh, so let's do that in 13 episodes quick. Yeah. Okay. Find a guy. Well, and they, Asian at all. they, they kind of, give him they seven kind minutes of botched it, to be honest, if you think about it. Because, you know, Daredevil, uh, kid loses sight. And uh, his other senses sharpen. You know, Jessica Jones, she was possibly experimented on. Same for Luke Cage. 
Iron Fist. Uh, he defeated the and uh, punched the heart of an immortal dragon in a magical city. You can see where they struggled to figure out how to pull that one off. But is that their fault? Isn't that the canon? Well, I will say I would put it on their doorstep in the sense that it was known that from the very beginning that Iron Fist was going to be one of the four when they first announced the deal, let alone the shows, <clears throat> you know, as far as coming out. And they just they just screwed around so long, and then they had to rush it because they had to figure it out. I mean, they, they bought themselves some extra time by doing a second season of Daredevil. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot they, to uh, uh, suspension of disbelief, a lot more with Iron Fist. It's a, it's a little bit of a tougher pill to swallow compared to the other three, which are extraordinarily grounded, you know, in a, in a pseudo reality setting versus Iron Fist, which you're getting into fantasy. Mm. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I still think that they did leaps and bounds of evolution between defenders, his, um, uh, one episode, uh, cameo, a full episode cameo in, Luke Cage season two, and then into his own season. They, I, I, I mean, I would, you know, I give him, I give him a, you know, a couple good claps there. Like, good job, you, you guys really fixed it. And so, then now <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> cancel it. So, what do you think that they fixed? Because I think that they did a lot of good things with season one that don't get shown in martial arts movies all the time. Such as? Well, they did a lot with, you know, they kind of skipped the training montage idea and they actually showed some training aspects, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, it was about uh, in season one, Colleen Wing had a dojo and she was training students. And they showcased the relationship between teacher and student in a way that I don't think we have ever seen in Western produced media. Mm -hmm. What Entertainment about, media. would you, would you, would you agree that that's maybe the first time we've seen in a big, in a big way, in a big show, an actual dojo, a master student relationship, so to speak, or, or should I say teachers, a student teacher relationship since the Karate Kid? I, I yes. Pointed out, you know, as saying, Hey, this is the special place where they do the training. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think more so, there were things that you were never going to get in The Karate Kid because it was one-on-one. -on -one. There's a dynamic sure. that happens that, you know, all three of us are used to experiencing, that most of the people listening are used to experiencing, that <clears throat> occurs only because there are others in the room. Uh, I get you. The group setting. Yep. Yeah. And when I think about season two, again, one of my favorite things when I reflect is, again, the relationship between... Danny and Colleen that in season one, it's teacher student at the beginning of season two, it is not teacher student. <laughs> yes. It is very clearly mm -hmm. not teacher student. And they talk yeah. about that because it transitions back into teacher student and they address that. And you know what? A lot of us have been in schools <laughs> where the instructor is dating a student <laughs> and it never and it's that quite that messy, well. And we <laughs> yeah, all we I, talk about it. <laughs> I feel like we should have uh, called in and reported uh, uh, Colleen and, and Finn on that one. You know, <laughs> we should have reported them to whoever the sensei is at the dojo because you're just not supposed to do that. And we're, we're, you know, we're not going the route of spoilers, but it is the most honest account of what I feel it needs to be in that case. There was a separation. She said, yeah, well, I'm done being your, your girlfriend while we're training. And then she proceeds to whip yeah. his ass. Oh, yeah. In, in season one, there was also a, a really nice scene where uh, Danny walks in and they're practicing, the students are, and he's basically just giving them crap because they're not training hard enough to be warriors and starts beating the crap out of one of them with a shinai. And she comes out and goes, you know, what are you doing? And that does a really good job of showing different training styles, different goals of training that mm -hmm. we normally see kind of come head to head that way. It's like, <laughs> these guys are here just as a, you know, they're in that social, we want to learn something. It's a group thing rather than we are training to try and kill people. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, you know, 
we don't train to mm, survive battle in the way that we might have 50, 100, 200 X number of years ago, you know, it's just not the same. And you can, and, and I think they did, I, I agree that I think they did a good job of showing that difference, that old school, hard beat up your students until they learn approach versus basically how tr a lot of training goes today, which is you can't do that because you'll get sued and shut down. <laughs> Hopefully. Most of the time. So what what else did we like? What else did we like in uh, season two that, you know, we've got people that are listening fall into one or two camps. They either haven't watched it, but they're interested, or they have. So what would we say to the people who are kind of interested? Maybe they watch season one. They're like, eh, I don't know if I want to give up another 10 hours of my life. Well, I would say in, in, try, in kind of towards answering uh, something Jared had said before was, you know, kind of challenging me on what I liked better. The other characters, like in season one, I was interested in what was going to happen to, you know, uh, Danny Rand. And I was interested in what was going to happen to Colleen Wing. Beyond that, the rest of the tertiary, the rest of the supporting characters I almost didn't care what happened to them. And sometimes I found them just plainly annoying, not because they were acting that good to make me dislike them, but because I felt like their characters were bland, boring, poorly written, you know, paper thin in this season, everybody has at least a level of an arc. No, everybody had stakes in one way, shape, form or another. And that's what I was impressed with. That's when you see good writing is you could, you know, you've got a writer's room that can figure out how to juggle all these characters and not lose them in, in the, in the, you know, in the, the whole deal. Well, what I think they did, actually, I like this in both seasons, but I think they did a really good job of uh, showing good and bad motivations and reactions from all the other people as well. And I'm talking about the specifically the Meacham family. I guess season mm -hmm. we can tell that it's been long enough. But you know the um, I can't remember his name, not Harold, the son. Ward. 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 Thank you. Um, Ward. His character goes back and forth, and how much you like him on every episode. Almost, it's he's this corporate shill, and that's all he cares about. To okay, there's a reasoning behind the things he's doing, and. <laughs> God, he's almost a victim. You feel bad for him. And then he stands up for himself. And then that doesn't work out for him. And then he ends up, ends up being the bad guy again. But then at the very end, he's still the good guy. So I think they did a good job of showing that. And I think it kind of continued with, with that aspect in season two. I think I they took it to the max in the second season, personally. It was... am, I the, am I the only one that thinks that, that Simone Missick, the woman who played Misty Knight, deserves her own show somewhere in some way. You are not the only person. I mean, I, she I is about as, as powerful a screen presence, I think, as existed in Iron she Fist. She chews it up. She chews it up for sure. And she, she does a great she, job she in Luke Cage. I mean, she is solid. She is compelling. And, mm -hmm. you know, if, if she... Comic book-wise, she gets her own kind of thing going anyway, so... Does she? Okay, well... I, Hopefully, you were referring Hopefully. To I mean, she's a tremendous what are you about, actor. Daughters of the Dragon. Well, she's um, it, it, again, it's comic book, so it depends on exactly what time period you're looking at. But uh, she's in one of the versions of Hero for Hire, Heroes for Hire, as well. She's kind of the oh, least, okay. most recent one. Because you know, the whole Deserves talk it. was hoping that Colleen and Misty would get their own show uh, yeah. in Daughters of the Dragon, and I would, I would be ready to sit down and watch that, like you know, as two minutes from now, you know, totally. Now, the other piece I wanted to bring up character wise or, or, or actor wise mm -hmm. was somehow I missed it. Cause I'm a fan. Alice Eve showing up. <laughs> oh yeah. And the character she portrays, which, hmm, that which would I be felt a she a did a great problem. job. She, you know, That'd she plays be... Walker, Mary Walker. Yeah. And, you know, I think when we run down the, the list, every single person 
that his that was in Daredevil, with the exception of Deborah Ann Wall, who plays Karen. Mm-hmm. When we look down the entire cast of Luke Cage, um, Jessica Jones. I mean, Jessica, her character. I, I forget her name. Ritter, Kristen Ritter. Kristen yep. Ritter. She yep. di- she has done some stuff. But of the entire of this this segment of the Marvel universe, Alice Eve is the only one who's really done anything big. And so yes. for them to include her in Iron Fist, which was our, <clears throat> easily the weakest of the four, says something to me. And I don't know what it says, but it says something because <laughs> it just really seems trying so conflicting, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, her she and she. She didn't just show up and, you know, do whatever and drop her lines. She did a disturbingly good job. <laughs> that was exactly the words I was going to choose. It, 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 was, it was a tremendous role. She played it well. I suspect that she she took the role for the role, not for the she, compensation. She took, it ex- she took it very seriously. Um, it what was so amazing was you didn't realize how good of a job she was doing until later. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's a, a very underrated actress. Yeah. So we've, we've talked about a lot about what's gone on. Let's, let's talk about what could have been right. If we, if we could roll back time, there's almost a song. (laughs) <laughs> and and we could go to Netflix and say, no, there will be a season three. What would we want to see change to season three? You know, what would, what would our goals be? Well, okay. So here's a theory. My wife and I talk way too much about, you know, character development and stuff like that. And in female characters, and this is getting really archetypical, but you know, we'll, we'll get academic for in female characters, there's kind of three positions that they can have. They can have the maiden, the mother, and the crone is usually the way it's phrased. And that's kind of, you know, bandied about like that. But you never hear about that in male characters. So I've come up with, there's basically, there's, there's the apprentice and the hero. And that's the only two that males get. So I think in season one, we had the apprentice version of him where he was still learning things. In season two, we had the hero version of him. So, again, without giving spoilers away, the only thing that could really progress next would be um, him becoming a teacher himself, the mentor character. Well, I was going to say, there are, there are times when you've seen a fatherly mentor type character before in, in uh, you know, various media, whether it be TV or movies. Yeah, so sorry, that's why I was kind of thinking that that... that there should be that one out there. Not, you know, there's the, the apprentice, the hero, but then there's also that mentor type character who's past his prime, but he's obviously still, I mean, the, the Miyagi, the Miyagi character. Per, yeah. You know, sorry. I, I forgot I, to continue I, my thought with that. Um, I, I don't know though, if I think he was the true hero character, I think he, he was the hero character at times in mm-hmm. the second season. I don't think he was always the hero character and I cannot go farther than that without getting into too much, <laughs> but uh, he was at, at times much, he almost verged down to anti-hero um, to a point, to a point. I don't think he went fully that direction, but there's almost a, you know, uh, we can liken it to having a black belt when all of a sudden, you have that weird feeling like that everybody's looking at you very differently today. And Friday you had a color belt on, but Monday and people are asking you to show them how to do something. And you're thinking like, you've never asked me to show you a thing before. Like, why are you asking me now? Like it's just, we just had a weekend. That's all we had. And so you kind of uncomfortable with that new feeling, that weight. And I felt like maybe they were playing around with that trope a little bit. I don't know if they were purposely saying, hey, how does a black belt feel? Let's try that out. But that's what I took from it. Well, one thing to remember about everything in season one is socially and mentally, Danny's a 10-year-old kid. Because 
because that's when he stopped growing, essentially. He came back to the world. He was behaving just like he was when he was 10. He was expecting the world to behave just like it was when he was 10. So I think in season two, they gave him time to uh, become an adult, so to speak, and start to make his own decisions. Mm. That's, a, that's a good point. I like that. What about the... Mm, kind of subplot within of the villain and the martial arts school that they open? Seems a lot of uh, oh, yeah. parallels with Cobra Kai there, right? Yeah, that was my thought on that too. <laughs> it's that's a that's a hard R version of Cobra Kai right there. I think. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I mean it's uh, definitely showing a different way, so to speak. Much much like we you saw whether it's you know uh, you know uh, Miyagi Do versus Cobra Kai Dojo or uh, various other things or like we talked about with Danny coming in in season one and trying to, you know, be, you know, trying to beat up all the these kids into him. Yeah. Uh, and then Colleen's her, her way being different. Um, yeah, they're, they're, I think they showed that um, very differently um, training for a different purpose, of course. So your training would be different depending on what purpose you're training for, you know, um, yeah, no, they, I think they did a very good job of, of showing that. And then of course you have, a maybe, a two students in the same, hmm, coming up in the same school together. That's not a spoiler. I mean, if you've seen season one, they blatantly alluded to that going that route. Um, you know, you got two students who may be vying for the same title or mantle in this case the iron fist um and of course one getting it and one not getting it I mean, sometimes whether you, you see that maybe with the the uh two to the top students wanting to take over the dojo or or have it willed to them and only well only one gets it and the others disenfranchised well, i think know, they played it that well real well too it, it, it without being a superhero trope um you always have to have the villain that has the same powers as you, but does it differently. So, you know, the green air, uh, green mm -hmm. has got Sinestro. He's got the same, essentially the same powers. He just has different motivations. So you always need that dark mirror character. And I think they did a great job with that. Yes, I agree. A great point. So we've spoken to the people who are interested Right, we, we've given them some reasons. We've spoken to the people who, you know, have watched it, you know, and they're probably listening and thinking, hey, you know, I, I, I want more detail. And this might be a good time to let them know that you two are going to have a separate conversation where, you know, you dig in and you give some spoilers and, and we'll, we'll post that. That'll happen somewhere, I assume, Jared, that'll happen over on, on your site on Martial Thoughts. Yeah. So uh, okay. don't look for that on martial arts radio because i i'm i'm not good at talking at that level you guys have watched have, have you guys both watched it twice I, I watched season one uh twice and see and then i was getting uh, ready to ju uh, jump into season two so i, I re-watched season one to make sure i cemented everything in my brain oh you are more committed i than have I only watched both one time i i i could not possibly pull it off again because there's too many other things with daredevil out now and then you know a bunch of other shows going on so um i i did you know youtube certify myself and get refreshed and get my mind back to where everything was uh so i did that i did the uh, cliff notes version <laughs> so i just i just want to kind of go back and you know my to me the most important piece about Iron Fist is that there was an, an, an attempt, however successful or unsuccessful you may view it, to present martial arts and martial arts relationships, student teacher, school, etc., in a way that we do not typically see. And it was it was trashed. And I came out, you know, this was 
I, st- I started this narrative prior to the first season of Into the Badlands when I said, look, guys, if we want martial arts content, we have to support it when it's here. And we didn't. And now it's gone. And it's going to, I suspect it's going to take something pretty compelling to get a studio to take a risk like this again. Well, to what you're saying, there are other things coming out. Um, Good. Uh, Eco, I, I believe Eco Weiss is working with Netflix on a TV series. Yay. Um, or an episodic series. I guess it's not, it's not TV, it's Netflix, whatever. Um, <laughs> That uh, sounds so old fashioned when you say it that way. Um, I know that there is Cinemax is doing something with the Bruce Lee Foundation uh, called Warrior. And yeah, his original based, idea that became Kung Fu. Yes, it's based off his original idea before it turned into yeah before it turned into Kung Fu. Um, so there's that. I personally think we're getting. I, I, my personal feeling is I think we're in a bit of a renaissance, and if we if we support it we're going to get more. We've got season two of Cobra Kai. Cobra Kai was amazing. I'm sorry. It was, it was, it was just, it, it could have been so many different versions of bad and campy and it was just <laughs> flat out. Great. We've gotten, um, I think the raid, those movies, I really don't think that they can be overstated as to how they've changed. And quite frankly, I think they've shown, hopefully they've shown, um, directors maybe specifically speaking american directors how to direct action i mean you know they they have some of the longest unbroken cuts that i've ever seen on film Mm. and and then you get eco weiss and he comes over in mile 22 and his talent is wasted it's absolutely wasted on screen they do that hyper fast, almost nausea inducing editing that you can't even tell where he's at. It looks like they just took a bunch of random scenes and smacked them together. Um, right. And then you get something like the night comes for us, which if anybody's seen it back, back to that higher bar of martial arts and cinema, uh, John wicks. That was what I was going to mention. Yeah. I mean, come I mean, we, if, but we have to support it. You're, you're totally right, Jeremy. We have to support it. Otherwise, Let's go through another. What was it since? Um, um, let's let's go back into the B the B movie basement with our toys and pack them up and go back down there in our grandma's basement and watch bad movies, hideous scripts, maybe some decent action, but you know, or we can support this and maybe we'll get more. Right now, so while I, you were speaking, just because yeah. I hadn't heard of this this Netflix project for for Eco Uwais, uh, it's called Woo Assassins. Yes, that's it. It's airing next year, 2019, on Netflix. And uh, despite it being called Woo Assassins, RZA is not showing up anywhere in the cast. <laughs> so that's just <laughs> um, because you period, totally would have expected him to be there. And it looks like it's 10 episodes. My understanding so is it's actually a period piece. It actually takes place in like 40s, 50s, 60s San Francisco. That's my understanding. So that's that'd be cool. That's by, that's that's setting a bar there. I think of, yeah, of, I agree. you know, production value. Um, yeah, it, it's, I, I mean, maybe I'll, maybe I'll set up a few rigs, uh, in my house to constantly watch that show on repeat to, to <laughs> just help to get drive the download up the numbers up. up, just so I can get the download numbers up going. Yeah. The stream numbers make them pump them up. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds insane. Oh, oh, it sounds I'll, insane I'll and some funds towards the electricity. I won't do it, but it, it uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe that's the way to go. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm just grumpy that iron fist got canceled. So yeah, me too. All right. What final thoughts do we have as, as, as it regards iron fist, as we say our communal goodbye to to Finn Jones and Danny Rand having their own series. I say if you haven't watched it, it is worth it. It's worth your time to go through season one and season two. Um, If you don't like the martial arts from season one, at least the story and the presentation of martial arts is good. Season two, the fights do get better and the story is still gets better. 
I, yeah, I have to, I have to agree with that. I mean, for me, it's almost, uh, Hey, if, if this is it, if this is the last time we see at least this incarnation of, of Iron Fist and Colleen and, uh, whatever on screen, um, good job. You, you really did, you, you guys really did fix up a lot of things that were rushed, hurried, maybe poorly executed in the first season. Um, not that I think it was terrible, but there was a lot of things that could be critiqued. And you took a character that uh, you fixed it up. You polished it up. You did a good job. Mm. Yeah, I'll agree. And if nothing else, we, we can call Finn Jones a martial artist now because he had to learn some stuff. <laughs> he, he definitely learned some stuff because uh, you could tell they weren't hiding him as much. Right. It's not so much the hoodie of doom anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Cool. Why don't you why don't you wrap us up, Scott? All right. Well, thank you for listening in. You definitely, definitely should um, check out Iron Fist season two. Maybe if they see the numbers go up, maybe they decide to re repackage them. I don't know, uh, considering the fact that nobody knows what's really going on behind the scenes with Marvel, Netflix, and whatever. Um, but going forward, if we get martial arts content on film. TV stream, we should really support it. So that's my that's my parting thoughts. Uh, thank you for joining us. As I'm sure many of you can tell, I love talking about martial arts, and I love talking about martial arts with friends. In here, two friends that I have only because of this show. So thanks, guys. Had a good time. We'll find an opportunity to do it again. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes. And head to whistlekick.com to find the stuff that we make. Don't forget, code PODCAST15 gets you 15% off everything, no matter what it is. You can follow us on social media. We are at Whistlekick. And you can email me if that's your preferred way, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I want to thank you for your time. Thanks for joining us today. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. What? <laughs>